Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Our guest today is Dr. Alan Botkin. Dr. Botkin is a clinical psychologist who worked for 20 years treating combat veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder, also known as PTSD. In 1995, he accidentally discovered that a variation of the therapy he was using, called EMDR, reliably resulted in his patients experiencing an after-death communication, also known as ADC, with the deceased person they were grieving. The healing associated with these experiences went well beyond what has even been considered possible in the fields of trauma and grief work. Since then, Dr. Botkin has further developed and refined his method. He calls this therapy induced after-death communication, or IADC. In 2003, Dr. Botkin founded the Center for Grief and Traumatic Loss and shifted his focus to the treatment of civilian grief and trauma. He is the author of the book called Induced After Death Communication, a new therapy for healing grief and trauma, and has now trained many therapists all over the world in his procedure. His website is inducedadc.com, or you can simply visit wedontdieradio.com and click on episode 108. So now it is my sincere privilege and pleasure to say, Dr. Alan Botkin, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thanks for having me, Sandra. I'm look, really looking forward to this. Oh, I'm looking forward to it as well. And you and I met very briefly, um, but I heard you speak back in, I believe it was 2005, at mm-hmm. a conference. And your story so riveted me on my journey and my expedition to prove life after death is real uh, that I included you in my book. And I think that's important to say because you're in a very, very important man and you've done an awful lot uh, for this field. So I'm excited and a little nervous to talk to you, but it, more excited, I would say. <laughs> Very funny. Me too. Yeah, yeah, it's really great to hear your voice. If you don't mind, g- could you give, give us a little bit of your background? Because I believe you worked in the VA hospital back mm-hmm. in the day. And yeah, if you would, okay. give us a little bit um, about you. Yes? Yes. Um, I began, uh, after I finished my doctorate, I got a job at a VA hospital in the Chicago area, and I ended up working on an inpatient PTSD unit for combat veterans, and I ended up doing that for about 20 years. And when I first started working there, the... um, The work was absolutely grueling. It was a burnout position. People didn't want to stay. And the therapy we were providing at the time was extremely grueling for our uh, most deserving combat veterans. And it was just a very painful situation. But we thought we were doing a good job in that we were providing what was the best available treatment at the time. And we provided that in a safe and supportive and non-judgmental environment and so on. Um, but then in the early 80s, no, uh, in the late 80s, um, uh, a, n- a new discovery came out by Dr. Francine Shapiro, and she called it Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing, or EMDR. And when we first heard about it, we we thought it sounded silly, and we laughed about it, as as many people do when they first hear about the uh, EMDR. Um, the idea was to have the patient attend to uh, a certain aspect of their traumatic memory, and at the same time, you moved your uh, the therapist moved his or her hand left or right and the patient was instructed to move their eyes and follow the moving hand. Okay. At the same time, they were paying attention to whatever that piece of that memory was. 
And what we found, is, and what Dr. Shapiro uh, had reported, was that when you do that, whatever the person is paying attention to rapidly processes, very, very rapidly. And so what we had been doing um, prior to EMDR was, was something called exposure therapy, which is you just have the patient continually bring up the trauma and re-experience it over and over. And the idea was is that if you do that for, uh, so many times or long enough, the emotional intensity of the memory will eventually diminish. Wow. Well, we got um, some, we did it that way. We got very modest results and it was very painful and grueling for our, our patients, sure. as I said. Because when they talked about the memory, that day in therapy at night, they um, often either didn't go to sleep or if they did fall asleep, they would have a nightmare of the event they talked about during the day. And um, so it was tough. Mm -hmm. um, but then with, with the eye movement, what the eye movement does better than anything else, number one, it pulls up the memory completely. So people feel like they're, you know, reliving it again. Uh, and if you continue to process with the eyes, the memory then changes. And there have been a lot of neuroimaging studies lately to show that um, prior to eye movement, only certain parts of the brain light up in isolation. And after eye movement, it, the whole brain gets involved. So it's really like it's a method to get uh, the brain to kind of heal itself. Interesting. And now, the, the difference between a normal memory and a traumatic memory is when it comes to a traumatic memory, one doesn't only remember it, one relives it. Yes. It feels like, so the, the event may have been 35 years in the past, but when they remember it, it feels like it's happening all over again. Now, what's wonderful about these eye movement techniques is that... Um, if, if you can bring it up and then process it, um, the, the we can take, by doing that, we take the reliving component completely out of the memory. And our patients used to say things to us like, you know, this is strange, Doc, but, you know, when I think about it, for the first time it feels like it happened a long time ago and it's over. Wow. And, yeah. And we were just absolutely thrilled. I mean, the my colleagues and I would have a great session like that. We'd run e run into each other's offices, close the door, and give each other a high five. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> we big. Were just so excited. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as the story goes, um, I began. We actually, I and my. Uh, nearly all my colleagues um, got officially trained in EMDR and you know we um, and we used it all the time um, there was never a situation where we wouldn't use it when it came to combat trauma and so uh, as time went on and it what's interesting too is people um, veterans um, instead of being up all night or having a nightmare of the event they worked on they would have their best night's sleep that night. Mm, terrific. That, that, uh, better than they had had in years. So so it, it was absolutely wonderful. We were thrilled. Um, our, our patients liked it. Um, and they wanted more. And we were uh, willing and able and wanted to give them, give them more. So, But anyway, as time went on, uh, I started to not like certain aspects of the standard EMDR pro protocol. It's like, well, why did they do this and why did they put that in there? And so I had an opportunity to do uh, uh, some experimentation with uh, the standard EMDR. And some of my ideas ended up not working, but a, a number of my ideas actually made the procedure work much better and more rapidly. For example, um, when it comes to like a traumatic loss, um, people often feel anger, people often feel guilt, um, and people always feel sadness. We're wired for sadness. 
And if someone says, well, if I ask somebody, what, what, what kind of feelings does this bring up? And they say anger, and I, I go, what else? And they go, that's it. Then I, I know they're using that anger to cover up the sadness. Mm -hmm. So what we would do, or what I started doing, is I just went right after the sadness. And I found that if I could process the core sadness, the anger, the guilt, the irrational cognitions, all that stuff just vanished. Wow. So it's like if you hit the target, you get the whole thing. So my approach was much more direct. Um, and we, we were literally having 10 minute sessions and we were done. <laughs> um, Terrific. Now that doesn't hold up um, with losses that are more recent, but losses that happened many years in the past. Right as it did with my, the Vietnam vets I was working with and so on, um, uh, it, it can work much faster. And I, there are technical reasons for that. But um, So anyway, um, so I'm going along. I've made like uh, five changes to the standard EMDR, and I'm getting really good results. And I'm teaching my colleagues how to do it, and I'm teaching... Uh, doctoral level interns that I'm supervising, and they got just as good at it uh, as as I was, and um, which was really nice to know. It wasn't just something about me, but it was the procedure itself. Yes. So we were going along, and uh, then something real strange started to happen, and I didn't know what it was. Um, I was working with a, a a marine named Sam. I call him Sam. And he was in Vietnam, and he developed uh, a very close father-daughter kind of relationship with an orphaned Vietnamese girl who was about 10 years old, mm -hmm. and her name was Lee. And Sam had plans to adopt Lee and bring her back to the States with him and so on, and his wife even approved of it. Um, he didn't know at the time that the United States government would likely not have approved, but... Uh, so anyway, um, he, he'd go out and patrol, come back to the base camp where Lee, where Lee was working, and um, you know they'd always get together. She'd tell him he would tell her about the United States and Chicago, living in Chicago. And all that stuff. But, but anyway, I was working with him on this issue, and it was a very traumatic thing because Lee was essentially shot and killed while while Sam was there. Oh no. And he went over and picked up her lifeless body and cried and cried and cried. And uh it was extremely traumatic. He 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 uh literally almost fell out of his chair. He was just sobbing so profoundly. Sure. And but anyways I got his attention and got him to get his eyes to start to move and and we, we did a couple sets of eye movement, and, and and the sadness started to come down right away. So I then gave him another set of eye movement, and he, he closed his eyes, which is part of the way I do it. I, I instruct them to always close their eyes. And he, I'm sitting there looking at him, and he's still got tears running down his face, and all of a sudden a big smile comes over his face. And I'm looking at him, I go, what, what the heck's that? I've never seen that before. Right. Um, you know, the the eye movement can bring a lot of relief, but it doesn't, you know, necessarily make people happy yeah. or joyful. Sure. But he, so, he, so then he opens his eyes and tells me what happened. And what happened was is that Lee came to him in spirit, and she looked like um, a grown woman, you know, I don't grown 20 years old, something like that. And she was dressed in, in a beautiful white gown with long, beautiful black hair. And he said she was surrounded by the, by the most beautiful light I had ever seen. And, um, and then he went on to say that he told Lee privately, I love you, Lee. And she told him, I love you too, Sam. And she thanked him for taking such good care of her back then. And then Lee reached out and gave him a hug. And he... And he's, as he's telling me this, he said, I could actually feel her arms on my shoulders and neck. Oh, <laughs> wow. Now, I, I knew what a near-death experience was because yeah. I had read Raymond Moody's books and so on. And um, 
but I thought that I didn't know what this was. I didn't know what an ADC was. I found the Guggenheim book only somewhat later and found out that these are actually common experiences. So, but anyway, at the time I thought maybe he had hallucinated because he had the, the pain of the loss where he caused him to psychologically decompensate. Right. So anyway, he, all, he, he kind of just sk skips out of my office and he goes down and he's in this great mood. Well, I, I told the uh, evening shift to keep an eye on him because he had been through a lot and he had kind of a strange experience and I wasn't sure what was up. So, you know, keep an eye on him and tell the night shift staff, you know, to do the same. So the next day I come in and, and at morning report, Sam had a great night and slept like a baby. Mm. So, and he showed no, no signs of psychological uh, uh, decompensation at all. As a matter of fact, it was the next, the, the next weekend, um, he went out on pass to visit his family and he had a, um, a daughter who he had completely avoided while she was growing up because she would remind him of Lee. Mm. And so every time he looked at his daughter, you know, the memory of Lee getting shot and dying, you know, would come up. So he just avoided his daughter. So anyway, he goes home on pass for the weekend and and uh and sits down and talks with his daughter and starts and he said oh he said you know i expressed my affection for her and and we talked a long time and then he, he said he was making up for lost time with her wow that completely shifted you know what was going on in his life sure and sam was absolutely Con, uh, convinced that was really Lee. Mm -hmm. There's no question about it. And and then I thought, well, that's pretty. Just when I, all of that started sinking in, some more of my patients, um, more of my patients began having the experience. And then uh, it was right around that time I read the Guggenheim book, Hello from Heaven, where they they did this a uh, massive survey of uh, people. Uh, who have spontaneously had these ADC experiences. And and, and I, I'm reading the book thinking, oh, my God, this is what my patients are saying. It's the same stuff. So, uh, and then some point in there, I further refine the technique because some of my patients were having the experience and some of them uh, weren't. And so I was able to figure out what I did differently uh, with the patients who did have the experience. And then I applied that to all the rest of my patients. Then nearly all, nearly everyone was having the experience. Well, and these experiences are, are vivid, like people um, feeling like they're with their deceased yeah, loved um, ones? It, it's, um, it, it, they come in different forms. Um, many of them are visual. Uh, many of them are tactile, where, where, you, where you feel a hug and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes there's verbal communication. And it's interesting, when it comes to verbal communication, it's not like they hear sound, sound waves coming through the air. It's not like that. It's more of a telepathic sharing of, uh, of verbal information. Mm -hmm. And it's also kind of interesting, too, that I worked with many patients who later in life felt bad about uh, killing uh, Vietnamese soldiers, the enemy. And they went back and, and, and really um, went through the same grief process for the people they had killed. And, and, and when they communicated in the ABC experience, uh, it was very clear and so on. They communicated just fine. And I remember I started to ask, what, what language were you speaking, English or Vietnamese? And the guy looked at me and said, well, really neither one. It's, it was a language that, that kind of went beyond words. So. It's incredible. I've talked to a number of mediums who have correctly brought through really profound messages. Of course, the person they were with didn't speak any English or the deceased person you know so it's like what how, how is that possible yeah oh that's, oh that's interesting yeah yep. yeah 
So yeah. there's a so, universal language somehow. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, and, and I remember and, uh, my guys telling me, you know, it's not just words. The, the feelings are expressed with the words mm -hmm. in a way that normal language doesn't do. But um, but anyway, at that point, I was off and running. And I was teaching a lot of people um, who worked at the VA how to do it, and everybody else was, uh, that I taught was able, were they were all able to um, get similar results or the same results. And it, can I just ask you? It wasn't so much like looking for proof of life after death. It was more healing, right? Like this Absolutely. dramatically healed people or helped them on their way. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, I started off my career really wanting to help these, again, most deserving combat veterans who really needed it. And I was absolutely thrilled that we finally had something that could take the pain away as opposed to helping people just sort of live with the ongoing pain. You know, we actually had something that worked. And... Um, that's always been my guiding principle, find something that works. Right. And, and then, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, doctor, do you think this is proof of life after death or that these are real experience, spiritually real experiences? And my general response is I'm into healing. That's my number one priority. There are a lot of other people out there arguing about what's real and what isn't. And if you really want a, a, uh, an informed opinion on that, you need to ask somebody who had the experience. Right. Because those are the only truly informed ones. So I would say, why are you asking me? I'm just a psychologist. Go talk to my patients. <laughs> They'll tell you. Yeah. 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 Have you ever had this done to you? Uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to go into it in any detail. No, but it's okay. I, I did it once on myself, and then once I had somebody do it for me. And what was, the two experiences I had are very similar to all other induced ADCs, which is in the, in the sense that you don't get what you're looking for or what you want. You know, like I was expecting to see a certain thing, and it didn't come that way. It came a completely different way. And because um, it's, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, this is just wishful thinking. Your brain is making it up and all that kind of stuff. Um, people don't always get what they wish for. Sometimes the deceased tell them things they don't want to hear. Such as? Can you give me an well, example? Well, I was working with uh, one guy, and he had lost his mother. No, yeah, he had lost his mother, but then he also had a son that was murdered. And he and his wife, uh, the mother of the son, um, uh, divorced as a result. It was too much stress for them, and they sort of blamed each other for what had happened. Yeah. And so... We're doing the, um, at the time we were doing the IADC with the mother, and he wanted to ask his mother for advice on what, what he should do. And his mother said, you should forgive your wife, your ex-wife, and go back and, and start your marriage again. <laughs> and he, and he, he opened his eyes and said, no way am I going to do that. Right. Yeah. So, sometimes people don't even understand what the deceased are telling them. I had one guy asking his father for advice, his deceased father for advice, and his father said, use your tools. And he opened his eyes and he said, you know, my father said, use your tools. I, I don't know what that means because, you know, I haven't worked on a car, you know, in 20 years and my skills are way behind time. You know, I, why would he say that? You know, my, the tool, my toolbox is rusted out in the back of the garage. So I go, well, ask him uh, what he meant by that, get some clarification. So I took him back to the experience, and his father tells him, not those tools, the tools you're learning in therapy. Ah. <laughs> this is so good, it, good stuff. A, a lot of experiences like that certainly suggest that these aren't just brain-generated 
kinds of experiences. Oh, yeah, definitely. I've, I've listened to so many accounts of so many varied things that I know we have very powerful brains, but I also believe there's a lot of miraculous things happening around us, you know, and when you start talking about quantum mechanics and everything's energy, yeah, mm -hmm. I think there's so much more to life than meets the eye. Dr. Yeah. Botkin, when did you decide that, like, you really found something here and you need to make this available to the general population, not just veterans? Well, as I continued to work with veterans for about the next seven or eight years after having made that discovery uh, and again getting wonderful results, I was very aware of the fact that hospital administration, um, if they found out what I was doing, um, would tell me not to do it. Right. And there was no, there, there's no way I would have stopped doing it. And then the, the, our, the director of our unit um, was, kind of, was a very influential guy, um, actually started to get complaints from the front office because an article I had written appeared in uh, some journal. And, um, and my boss, the director of the unit, came and told me about that. He said, you know, I'm protecting you. So, and it, he said the ar only argument he used was that, you know, the people in the front office are all, always worried about numbers, mm -hmm. you know, keeping beds full and all that kind of stuff. And people, uh, there was a waiting list of about eight months for people who wanted to get into my particular program. So it was great for numbers, so, so they backed off. Um, but that director then a few years later retired he came to me and said i i can't run protection for you anymore i'm not going to be here and so um i was eligible for an early retirement and i went ahead and took it and it's wonderful i i absolutely loved working with the vets it was sure. the best job in the world i ever had and uh but I knew I couldn't keep in. I couldn't keep the secret, which is basically what we were doing mm. when, when we were at the VA. We we kept we kept what we were doing secret as best we could, and so. But I, I it was it was my moral duty. I as I saw, saw it at the time uh, to leave the job I love, so you know I can bring this to the world. So you, and so I yeah. left and wrote a book, and things rolled from there. Yeah, and, and could you just talk a little bit about the book? I know I have it on my bookshelf. Um, mm -hmm. I, I read it after we met, but I have to review it to see what's in it. But it's your journey of what you learned. Oh, oh, and I, in the bio I gave you was uh, I had the title of my first edition book. I have a second edition book that's a little more up to date. And it's induced after death communication, a miraculous therapy for grief and loss. Oh, perfect. And for so, our listener, on the website, we don't die radio.com, episode one oh eight, I have a link to that book. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And so that, that's a newer edition, it's a little updated. Um, but I uh, it wasn't easy to get a publisher. In fact it took me years to get a publisher. And then I finally got one, and it was Hampton Roads. And um, as a matter of fact, my, my, my first uh, agent quit, literary agent quit on me. So, I, you know, I, I gave it my best shot. We're not going to get a deal. And then it was like two weeks later, I got a deal on my own because I contacted uh, Frank DeMarco at Hampton Roads and basically begged him to reconsider. Wow. And he did, and they published it, and it ended up being their number two book uh, for years. Oh, that's fantastic! So I'm sure they were happy they did that eventually. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, and the, the book is kind of the hub of what I do. I mean, it's a way for people to um, to kind of understand a little bit of the history that I'm talking about, or had, did talk about earlier, and uh, I have a lot of cases in there. I think there are 84 different cases um, that are that are summaries of cases. Mm -hmm. 
And and so the the reader will get an idea of all the you know possible variations of what could or might happen, you know, in doing this kind of work. Yeah, it's such good material because I think for most of us, I mean, this when I first heard you speak, I thought, oh my gosh, like how is that possible? And it just opened up a another world, and to not just hear your story about Sam, but to hear about other cases, it it goes. You know, sometimes it takes a little while for the skepticism to wear off when you start hearing these stories. And I tell you, even if somebody doesn't end up having a, a session, um, induced ADC session, to hear stories of what's possible, it's like, this is real. Yeah. This is yeah. very, and, very you know, real. And I, I've gotten a lot of feedback from people saying, you know, uh, that just reading the book gave them hope and they were uplifted by it. Yes. Oh, that's nice, too. Because grief is awful. Yeah. I, I'm sure you've yeah. lost your share of loved ones, and it's... Yeah, yeah. No matter how together we may have it, it's not like we could just choose to turn off grief one day when we no longer feel like feeling it. I yeah. mean, it's yeah. awful. Or, you know, or it doesn't automatically go away in a year or six months. No. Yeah, you know, there's some people, probably most people... You know, unless they get some form of eye movement therapy that actually changes the way, you know, it's represented in the brain, um, people grieve for a lifetime. Yes. And yep. people never get over it. And, you know, that unresolved pain, you know, can cause other psychological disorders and, and so on. And it can make for a miserable life. It sure can. And, you know, the other thing, too, is I tell people, some people come in and see me and they say, I don't want to give up my sadness or my grief uh, because that's the only connection I have with so-and-so. And I say a couple things when they say that. And the first, the first one is, is when, what we are going to be doing doesn't, doesn't sever your connection, but it replaces a negative connection with a positive connection. And what that often happens prior to the ABC, when that sadness gets processed and goes way down, people spontaneously have good memories of their deceased loved one. Sometimes people will start laughing and think of fun things they they did with the that they did together. Wow! And so the, the mood completely shifts, and that's you know that, and so that's giving a person a positive connection. And then I say. Let's say Bob is the guy who died, you know, um, do you think Bob uh, would, would want you to hold on to him with pain and suffering? And the answer, is, of course, is always, well, no. Well, you, you know, if, if there is an afterlife, and, uh, and what I've gathered from it is uh, the deceased uh, always trying to get through to us but they have a, it's not easy for them to do that and what IADC does is it, it gets people it, first of all it gets that sadness aside which gets in the way mm -hmm. and puts a person in a more positive higher vibrational state where they can now the, the deceased person it opens the door for the deceased to come in but the, they can't get through that profound sadness people have. And even people who have spontaneous ADCs have them during those off times when they're not feeling sad in the moment. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I've heard stories of people with the relaxed just before going to bed or waking up in the morning or just enjoying yeah. a hot shower. And yeah. I, I just recently uh, started to try to meditate. You know, I've heard mm -hmm. so much about it for so many years, but I thought, well, let me, you know, really try to do this. And yeah. it's been interesting because uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I would have to say it was a after-death communication, but I saw so vividly my grandfather as a young mm -hmm. man in mm -hmm. 3D, and I could oh. hug him and feel his whiskers and see him, mm -hmm. and he... I mean, he was real. Now, I've never even seen a picture of my grandfather from those days. It wasn't in black and white. And mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever seen him looking like this. And it, it yeah. was when my mind was still. And it didn't last very long. But yeah. did it ever make me happy? Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, it, your mind is still, you know, you're not over overwhelmed by sadness, and you get some of that mind clutter out of the way. Right. That constant chatter that we all have, you know, and just kind of open up. And in IADC, I call it the receptive mode. We, we get, after we've cleared the sadness and we do the eye movement to induce the experience, it, I always instruct the person, just let whatever happens, happen. There's, there's nothing for you to do. If you try to make it happen, it won't work. If you mm -hmm. try to think of what it's going to be like, it won't work. Just let it come to you. There's nothing for you to do except just be open to anything. And um, because some people say, well, isn't this like hypnosis and giving somebody a suggestion? And the answer is absolutely not. If you do IADC and try to suggest the experience, it never works. Mm -hmm. It's a very natural experience that people just need to be wide open to. Wow. How long does a, se a session take? Well, right now I see, I see people uh, um, on Saturday and Sunday morning, or Saturday and Sunday, uh, um, two sessions on, on uh, consecutive days. Okay. And um, the first session is 90 minutes. And the second session is 30 to another 90 minutes, depending on how long it takes to finish. Mm. So just uh, two, say two 90-minute sessions, and, and that's it. We're done. That's awesome. And are the most of the people that are attracted to this people that are experiencing deep grief? Or do you have people that are just want to find out if their loved one is close by? Most of my people have some pretty serious grief issues. Mm -hmm. That's what I was Most thinking. Of them. Some, some come and they're just kind of curious. But what's interesting about those folks, they'll say, oh, you know, my grandmother died 20 years ago and I was real sad for a long time, but I got over it. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think I have any sadness. And then when I start giving a mind movement, all the sadness comes out that, that they didn't realize they were still carrying. And so at, at that point, it does become a more real um, grief issue. You know, it's like human beings, we, it's like we have this little box in us somewhere where we try to stuff negative memories and tie on the lid really tight and, and then not pay attention to it anymore. And then we sort of get on with life. Um, but, you know, so many of us, you know, carry that unresolved sadness. And again, for a lifetime. Wow. Have you kept in touch with some of these folks to know how they're doing years later? I mean, has it really helped uh, people in the big scheme of their life? Well, one would think it would, for yeah. sure. Now, um, it's not a cure for PTSD. It is a cure for um, perhaps the most important group of symptoms, which, which are the re-experiencing symptoms, mm -hmm. like nightmares, flashbacks, intrusive thoughts. If you, if, if, if one can process that with the IADC, a particular traumatic memory, that night, nightmares for that memory stop, no more flashbacks, no more intrusive thoughts, that all stops. Now, but PTSD is a very complex disorder. It involves like hyperarousal and other more physiologically based uh, symptoms that tend to be more resistant to treatment. Hmm. I know with myself, I've not experienced that, but, you know, there's different things in my life when I've found the underlying root cause. It just seems like, uh, you know, once you find one thing, it just a lot of other things seem to disappear. And I just have this instinct yeah. that when people are free from some of this really deep sadness and grief, it'll impact yeah. different areas of their lives. Yeah. And I, too, have met people that have, you know, I call them... Um, I hate to say the walking dead, but they have died themselves because of a loss yeah. in their life and yeah. to set people free from that through, you know, so many different ways is just a huge gift because yeah. life is short, you know, and yeah. the last thing we want to do is look back and have regrets, you know. Um, yeah. You know, I, IEDC not only does very well with grief issues and traumatic grief, um, it also does well with all trauma. Um, you know, combat trauma, uh, other trauma that 
um, child, child uh, being abused as a child, wow. physically and sexually. I, I work with those kind of cases as well. In, in that case, the core issue that one needs to get to in process is not sadness, but it's fear. So there's generally no ADC experience at the end of a fear trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, but the processing of that core emotion is the same as it is with sadness. You know, we, we just go, instead of beating around the bush, we get right to it. And, uh, and especially if it happened a long time ago, we, we can, we can clean up a lot of traumas in just uh, the one weekend. Wow. That's incredible. That's really good to know. And yeah, yeah fear is, oh my God, it's brutal. You know, all, ma all mammals, which include us, are, are wired for fear and sadness. Hmm. You know, elephants get sad. Dogs get sad. And it's, it's obvious that we're all wired for fear as well. And we all have the fight or flight response yep. and all that. Um, so any therapy that wants to be thorough in terms of addressing uh, grief or trauma um, you need to recognize, one needs to recognize that sadness and fear are at the very core of all of this. And when, and with, even, even with the, um, a fear trauma, if I can process the core fear, all the anger and guilt go away. They just vanish. You go back and look after processing the core, you go back and look what happened to these other feelings. Yeah, they're gone. Because people use fear and guilt to protect themselves from experiencing these more co core emotions. Sure. At, at the VA, we used to call guilt and anger the what ifs. You know, what if he had done that? What if I had done that? This person would still be alive. What if, what if, you know? And um, even if you could figure out or, you know, it's, or you can't go back and, you know, back in time and change what you could have done or what someone else, but, you know, you have to, you have to um, accept what the core issue is because that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And if you go, and if you go up right after it, again, that other stuff just goes away. Wow. Do people have to like remember what their, you know, that core incident was? I mean, it's just, this yeah. bring that yeah. out now, okay the the, the 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 wonderful part about IADC it is that it can rapidly get people into feeling really good and and completely eliminate that fear and sadness in many or most cases um oh, I, I forgot your question I uh, yeah I did too I'm just thinking of <laughs> oh, I can't rewind it. It's okay. It's all perfect. Um, okay. No, I, I'm. I'm just thinking. I had that, a point to make. Yeah, it, it'll come up. <laughs> it'll come up. I'm just right. in the moment thinking of what a valuable thing this is that you've created and can help people in so many ways. So it's not just you in the world doing it. You've created a whole team of therapists, correct? Yeah. Um, yeah I've got. Um, I've trained people in, I, I don't know, 10, 10 different countries, 12 different countries. There's even an Allen Bakken Institute in Germany. Oh, congratulations. And uh, the, the bad part about doing this, when I left the VA, I was totally on my own. Right. And it's kind of a lonely existence, but I now have uh, an international team of uh um, I call it the International IADC Board, and we got somebody in Germany, two people in France, and um, a handful of people here in the States. And that's my training other people is probably the most important thing I can do. Yes, because because that just makes IADC more available to everybody. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Not everyone may be able to take the trip to see you and you're not going to last forever none of us will right. and to keep this right. carrying on is right. so vitally important is there any advice you can give our listener right now somebody that might be experiencing a deep sadness or grief okay um it depends on how long ago um the loss occurred um people call me or ask me um 
how long do you, um, you can you know, like they'll call and say, you know, I lost my husband two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. All right. And I always advise those people to wait, a, wait at least six months because the early stage of grief is characterized by shock and disbelief and emotional numbing. Yes. Which actually is pretty adaptive for what's going on. People have to make funeral, funeral arrangement, clean out bedrooms and you know, things like that. So you, you need to be a little numb just to get through that. And it takes some time for the sadness to fully sink in. So it's not so much whether it's six months or a year. It all, it, I always screen for how available their sadness is. In other words, when they come in and see me, they're going to need to feel their sadness while they're sitting there. And that means they have to go, and I think this is the part we both forgot, that means they have to go to the most, um, the worst part of their story first, even. Um, so if I, I, I worked with a woman who uh, came home one day and was calling for her 17-year-old son, he wasn't answering. She went down in the basement and turned on the light. He was hanging dead. Oh. And, boy, was that a dramatic session. Sure. Yeah. But, um, in fact, if you go to my website, induced-adc.com, um, under experiences, uh, her story is the first. Okay. And uh, it's actually a wonderful story. It's, it's tr- but... For, for me to process that, she had to bring up the image of her son hanging there and, and allow herself to feel the full sadness that went with that image. Wow. That's the hard part about sure. you. Have, you have to be able to do that. Uh, the good thing is, if you do that and move your eyes, you won't have to go back there again. It'll be different. So... I just don't see everybody, and people I train don't just see everybody. We screen people very carefully mm-hmm. first. We need to know about the availability of their sadness and, and so on and so forth. And, and then even uh, during the two therapy days, I spend uh, some time uh, building in safety measures before we even get started. What does that mean? Well, it means... This is your job. This is my job. Oh, okay. Here's how we work best together. Okay. If, it gets, if it gets to the point your sadness feels overwhelming and you can't deal with it, what you need to do, the best thing to, to do at that point is keep your eyes moving and got, get out of there. I like to use the analogy. You've probably driven on an interstate through one of those tunnels carved out of a mountain. And yeah. they just nod their head. And I go, well, if you're driving along and you get to the middle of the tunnel and it's dark and scary in there, the last thing you want to do is take your off the gas and hit the brakes. That's true. Because then you're stuck in a bad place. And I say it's the same thing when working on your sadness. When it gets to the point where it starts to feel intolerable and you can't deal with it, the best thing to do is not pull out or, or hit the brakes, in other words, is keep your eyes moving. And I say, if that happens, I'm going to coach you through it. And I'm going to say, come on, Sammy, stay with me. Stay with me. Good, good, good. Now, I coach them through those real difficult times. Yeah. Oh, it sounds great. Really, really sounds great. Dr. Bodkin, thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Hey. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you again in person. Do you have any just closing words or anything before we Uh, close the episode? Well, um, I'm happy to say that um, there have been a few articles that have been published, but it's mostly my stuff, uh, you know, pre and post uh, outcome studies, and, and they all turned out very positive. But there are two very important studies going on right now. The University of Virginia is doing a very sophisticated EEG study of IEDC therapy. And maybe even more important than that is uh, Jan, Professor Jan Holden at the University of North Texas is right now involved in a control group design study of IADC. So we're comparing IADC outcomes to another therapy and a waiting list control. And, and that's the, 
the gold standard in science is you what you need to do uh, control group studies mm -hmm. and once we get the, those done or particularly you know once we get the North Texas one uh, in and published and other people are going to probably want to do it and then once we get the science behind it um, larger organizations will tend to welcome us more so with open arms. Oh yeah. Who would have ever thought years ago when they came out with EMDR and everyone was laughing at it that you'd be where you are right now Yeah, and making such an impact? Well, I, I wish I could, I, you know, I'm never satisfied. I no. wish I could make a greater impact because I, I just, you know, I, I see things on television, you know, in the news, somebody died and, you know, another person's in horrible grief and I go, sure. you know. How, how can I call this person? It, yeah, them? yeah. You know, th there is something that works. So yeah, and and for our listener now too, I encourage encourage you uh, to go to Dr. Botkin's web website, induced dash eight uh, IADC, right? Yes. Yeah, well, it's induced hyphen ADC dot com. Yes. It, it also works without the hyphen. Oh well, that's even better. Okay, yeah. inducedadc.com. I like it that you have both available. <laughs> and also to check out um, his book, Induced After Death Communication, A Miraculous Therapy for yeah. Grief and Loss. That's awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you again. And for our listener, thank you for taking the time to listen today. I really hope it's been a value. And of course, it has been for me. Uh, pl please feel free to go to we don't die radio dot com and check out the other episodes. And in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. And I do personally believe with all my heart that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So go after some of these tools, read this book, learn more, um, and you just never know how your life will transform. So thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.